Okay, I'm back. And um, what we're going to talk about now is access rights. The first thing I want to mention about access rights um, that that I think isn't always that explicit is um, file permissions only make sense on an operating system that has user accounts and um, has a user registration system, which Windows does, which um, uh, Linux does, but which a lot of the early single user operating systems like DOS did not. On those operating systems, if you had access to the keys of the computer, you automatically had access to everything. Um, t t today, that's not entirely true. Um, in a way, you do, because you can always boot this system on another operating system um, or steal the hard drive or, or what have you. But, um, but if you play according to the rules, um, you don't have full access to everything. You only have access to what you're allowed to have access on on a, a computer. And so we have users on computers. And when you install Linux, the first thing you do is to install a couple users. First, you install the user root. And um, root is gone on a Linux, on a Unix system. Um, and um, every user has a user called root. And then everybody else is a user under that user with varying degrees of access rights. So when you do an install of a um, Linux system, first you um, the system installs root, and then it installs you or some user named guest or Nopix or, or um, uh, Asus or something or Linux as a user on the system. Uh, some many systems may only have a couple users on the system. Um, I my systems usually have quite a few. Um, although you can see this system is still pretty n new and fresh and doesn't have many yet. So when you do install a user, there's always a GUI for doing this or something like that. But there's also a command called user add, I believe, that will allow you to install a user. We'll learn to use that later um, because um, you can write scripts to add your add users if you do it using the command user add. Um, if you do it using the GUI, well, there's no automatic way. You've got to do all the work by hand. So, um, but what this does is when you add a user, it will probably set up an area under home for the user's home or for the user's files. And it will put the user into some sort of a registration process, which is usually kept down under default on, in the file password. And if you list that file, you will see that dmandel is a user down there. And you'll see a couple numbers here. Uh, one number is 44345. That is called my UID number, user ID number. The other number is G is a 100, which is associated with the group that by default I'm a member of. Uh, and it's called the GID number. Uh, let me type the word ID and see what I get here. It says, oh. I happen to be logged on as root, so it says my UID number is zero. I am root. Um, I'm in the group root, and my um, number there is, is a zero. That's not very interesting. Let me go to another window where I happen to be logged in as myself, I think. Let me type ID, where it says that I am UID 44345 and GID 100. OK and that that's a group you called users. OK. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Well, the main reason I'm bringing all this up is, remember, I told you that the uh, inode table stores all the rights for the files and stuff, and it 
and who owns files and all sorts of information like that. But I also said that this was kind of a spreadsheet. It's a fixed format, um, um, fixed length um, um, table. So it can't store your user names as dmandel or um, the man from La Mancha. That's a perfectly valid name, but it's they vary in length. And um, that table wants fixed length things. So what's it store? It stores the UID number. And it stores the group number, because those are fixed length. Those are 16-bit numbers. Um, everything in that table is some which way encoded as a number. Now, what does that mean? That has some impact on us, which we will talk about in the sense of, suppose um, one of you guys out there produces a Linux-style disk and mails it to me. And I mount the disk. And you've got a user on the system that you call dmandel, and, and uh, you, you um, you installed the user dmandel using the add user command. Um, he got whatever UID the system gave to him. I, I'm not sure. You know, probably 1005 or something like that. You send the disk to me. I attach the disk to my system. And suddenly, I go to try and access those files. But um, on my system, dmandel is. 44345. But on that hard disk, um, well, you thought he was going to be user 1005. However, on my system, I'm not 1005. I'm this other user. So I have, um, I don't have quite the right access to those files. And I will have to do some manipulations to change the access rights around. The real problem with this is. Suppose you get rid of, uh, you know, you have a user called Ed, and um, he's user 1005. You send him, or in some which way, he gets a hold of your disk. And um, you on your system, user 1005 is Shirley. Well, then Ed has full access to Shirley's files. So what I'm saying is that you can get a mismatch in files. And that can even perpetuate across networks using um, a system called NFS to share files across networks or share a file systems across networks. So what we usually try to do to keep our security straight on systems is as much as we can, we keep a big catalog of what user is what UID, and we try to keep that consistent across all of our systems. Um, that's sometimes really tough to do if you've got a, um, uh, a big network with thousands of, of systems in it. But um, And there are ways of fixing matters when things get goofed up. There's maps that you can use when you um, uh, mount file systems by NFS. There's 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 various ways to work around those issues, but um, I always recommend, you know, because in a small business setting, it's quite um, doable to keep the UIDs and the G GIDs the same, all, all, um, uh, consistent across all the systems, and that just works best. Um, it's it's ideal. If it doesn't happen, well, you can live with it. But if you can keep that that way, it's better. OK, now, um, the next thing we want to talk about is file permissions. File permissions, the book talks about file permissions here. And um, I talked about it in the Monday class. Um, and I think I'm actually not going to talk about file permissions very much, because the book does a very good job of that. Um, the uh, Read that section in the book. Also make sure you read the little thing about when you need to change file permissions, you use what the chmod command. If you need to change file permissions on an entire 
um, tree, then you have to use the minus R option on chmod. The same goes with the change ownership command, which is chown. And you probably have to be root to, act, to use that command, because otherwise you probably don't have the rights to change who owns a file. Um, likewise, um, uh, most of those commands have a minus R option to make it work on a whole tree. Um, the and you can either change file permissions by using the symbols R, W, and X, or you can do it by using um, oh, the numeric equivalents, which um, um, I won't go through how those are calculated. I don't really see that the book went through that either, but, but every Unix class goes through that. Um, maybe I will sometime. I will if people ask me, um, especially because it's mathematics and mathematics is cool, right? Oh, actually, the book does go through this to some extent on um, in table 4.6 on page 162. Um, the I'm looking. OK. The other thing the book, uh, the, another topic that the book discusses is UMask. And I'm not going to discuss UMask because the book does a really excellent job of discussing UMask. And that's a topic that I find is not discussed very well um, in very many books. So I, I'm very pleased with their discussion on that. Uh, the final thing the book discusses is um, special permissions. Um, the um, set UID and set GID and the sticky bit. Um, sticky bit we really don't use very much. The truth is, I hate to admit this, but every time I want to learn something about sticky bit, it's usually when I teach about sticky bit. <laughs> and um, and And I always have to look up what it is and how it's used. And if you see from the book, one of the issues with sticky bit is it's used a little bit different from one Unix to another Unix, which I think probably means that you know there's a lot of us in my boat that don't use it a lot. Um, in a way, I, I, um, the book's discussion of sticky bit is quite good, um, and uh, I leave it at that. But I do want to say a few words about UID and GID, um, and about SUID and GUID. OK, let's go back over here. Well, let's go over here. Suppose I want to change my password. Now, I think the password is, let's go over here where I'm root. And as I recall, the passwords are kept in an encrypted file a format in a um, directory under um, Etc. called shadowed. Right there. A root owns that, and notice that almost nobody has any access rights to that thing except root. Um, shadow can read it. If you happen to be a member of the shadow group, almost nobody is. Root can actually write to it, and that's about the only story. So if that thing is where my passwords are stored, how am I going to change? my password, because I can't read that thing. I can't write, and I need to write a new password to it. OK, the way that is done, um, let's take a look at this file again. OK, well, um, th there is a command for changing my password. I think it's called password. Um, and then it asked me my old password. and. Uh, Unfortunately, I've got to come back with a new part, so we're going to do that. Uh, I'll be right back.